Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to get started so we have uh, time to hear from our speakers and uh, plenty of time for discussion. Um, we're uh, very fortunate this afternoon to have the uh, release of a publication uh, that has been um, in the works for some time and, and really reflects some of the best uh, thinking of Carnegie and, uh, and others concerned with democracy about how to, how to look at the political system in Russia as it's been evolving over the last several years. So we are going to hear from the authors of the paper, and if you didn't have it, uh, it's available outside, but I think it was largely available here at the table. Uh, the topic is over de managed democracy in Russia, governance implications of hybrid regimes. Um, now that all sounds rather abstract, but I can assure you our speakers are going to be uh, uh, quite uh, concrete about uh, some of the more recent developments uh, in Russia uh, in, the, in the last uh, year to year or so. Um, I don't think the authors really need much of an introduction, but I will simply note that Henry Hale is uh, Associate Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University, and he directs the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. Um, he's uh, been working with uh, Nikolai Petrov and Masha for some time on this project, and um, I think is... Uh, will be our first speaker. Um, Nikolai Petrov uh, is, uh, I think, well known to this community. He is at our center in Moscow and uh, is an acknowledged authority on Russia's regions and the, re the, the role of uh, center regional relations in the political system of the Russian Federation. And uh, Maria Lipman, or as I call her, Masha Lipman, uh, is uh, a long-standing journalist by training, but uh, has been at Carnegie editing our journal Pro at Contra for uh, for a number of years, and she is uh, really one of the the best minds of watching what is going on in Russian media and its place in the development of Russian political culture and the society. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to ask Henry Hale to begin, Nikolai Petrov to go second, and Masha to be third speaker, and then, as is the custom, we will uh, talk about uh, the topic with questions and answers and comments from the audience. Uh, when you do uh, uh, ask a question or want to make a statement, if you'll identify yourself and use the microphone, we're uh, recording this for our website and so forth. So. I think without further ado, I will turn the floor to Henry Hale, and uh, he will begin with uh, a sort of overview of this project. Henry? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I will talk fairly briefly before turning it over to my colleagues. Um, just to start off the discussion, I think it's uh, worth uh, observing that we are currently very close to the midway point in Medvedev's first term. It's been over two years since he was elected. Um, and if we think about how his first term so far might compare with the first half of the terms of other Russian presidents, uh, we think back to Yeltsin and uh, recall that uh, during his first two years, um, among many other things, he had signed the CIS Treaty, effectively dissolving the USSR, introduced radical economic reforms, um, conducted a referendum on constitutional structure and, and confidence in the president uh, and the parliament, which ultimately set the stage for the uh, October 1993 uh, showdown. Um, and if we look at Putin, um, even you know, certainly within the first two years uh, since he was elected, um, he had created the federal districts, uh, reformed the Federation Council, the upper house of parliament, uh, removing the governors from that body essentially, um, instituted a new, a new relationship between the state and the oligarchs, which later came to, I think, uh, real fruition with the arrest of Mikhail Khodorkovsky slightly after the midway point in his first term, 
introduced a 13 uh, percent flat tax in the economy, which constituted a, a, a fairly radical change. Um, so these presidents had all done quite a bit during their first uh, two years in office. So I think the two years is a good amount of time. Um, it's time enough for people to, uh, in this office to use it to do something. And it's useful, therefore, to assess whether a leader is instituting real changes. And uh, at least judging by the previous two presidents, the first two years would give us a good indication as to where these uh, uh, systems are going. So now Nikolai, Masha, and I each have our own writings uh, on the general subject of the, the tandem and uh, what the Russian system works. Um, but Currently, what we're involved in is a, uh, a process of uh, developing a, a book where we're hammering out a common view on several of the more important questions uh, regarding Russian politics today, um, most basic ones including what the system is, how it works, um, how it actually supplies governance, and I think that's one of the interesting th things that interests us most about it because we see a lot of studies of political control, who exercises power. Um, but how is the state doing in terms of how it actually gets things done? Uh, you know, what are the implications for the management and control system for how services are actually provided? You know, how does the state do things that the state is supposed to do, uh, or at least that people might expect it to do? Um, and finally, how the Russian system compares with political systems in uh, other countries. And so, uh, as uh, Jim kindly mentioned, the uh, uh, first product is this, uh, of, our, of our joint work is this uh, working paper on overmanaged uh, democracy in Russia where it spells out some of the, the general propositions and then goes into detail in certain areas um, of that study. Um, we already uh, made a presentation at an earlier stage of this project when it was still uh, a work very much in, in progress. And so I won't uh, reiterate everything there. Um, but what I will try to do is just generally outline um, the, the broad perspective with which we're working um, and noting that, in fact, this is still a work in progress and we're all um, you know, very interested in your views and, and reactions. I think this will help us ultimately produce a better uh, product in the end. Um, one of the most basic propositions is that uh, Russia um, can fruitfully be thought of as a particularly sophisticated hybrid regime. Um, a hybrid regime being a political system that combines uh, some real elements of democracy and some real elements of authoritarianism. Um, a few people would actually call Russia a democracy, but it's interesting uh, to observe Russia, I think, in comparative perspective especially, um, because Russia stands out for combining both a very high level of political control, um, the degree to which it's removed political uncertainty, um, especially from elections, but from a lot of politics in general, um, and combining that with a relatively low level of actual repression, violence, and coercion. Um, you know, we're not, we're not talking, uh, you know, labor camps, massive jailings of opposition figures. And I think in comparative perspective, this is, is, is rare. And um, in addition, it's also interesting that they have achieved this by um, a very, very elaborate system um, designed to ensure precisely that, which seems to be to try and avoid the most repressive actions that uh, hybrid or authoritarian regimes around the world uh, have been known to undertake um, and still achieve this level uh, of control. And so the, uh, th this kind of sophistication or uh, uh, you know, elaborate nature of the regime is particularly interesting in comparative perspective and we, we've been trying to think of other countries um, that might have similar levels of sophistication uh, in this endeavor and so we'd be interested in your ideas. I mean one example that comes to my mind it may be Singapore um, but Singapore, obviously, is uh, much less surprising because it's, uh, it would seem to be, on the face of it, much easier to uh, manipulate a political system in an in a island uh, city-state. Um, whereas in Russia, we're talking one of the, well, certainly the biggest country in the world in terms of geography and one of the larger countries in terms of population, um, you know, very complicated in, in many, many ways. Um, so it, I, I think it's quite remarkable that, that uh, the, the rulers of Russia have managed to uh, create this system today. Um, now, speaking in, in um, I guess, stylistic terms, you we're approaching this. Uh, what, one question is, why has the system evolved in this way? And uh, I, I think, it, again, kind of from a, uh, in, not a historical standpoint, but a conceptual standpoint, um, the most obvious uh, reason, I think, is that uh, the authorities do want control, right? They, they want to stay in power. They want to provide order. But I think a point that is often overlooked is that um, 
the authorities actually <coughs> still want to preserve elements of democracy um, because they benefit from them. And I think they benefit from them not only um, by uh, you know, trying to retain international legitimacy of some sort or making sure that they gain access to international clubs that make democracy a criterion. Um, but they, elements of democracy, and this is one of the, the points that we make in the working paper, um, serve beneficial purposes. They're beneficial to the regime in many ways. Uh, dem democracy, political competition is a great way for generating information, generating feedback on what policies are working, what policies aren't, how the population is reacting. Uh, you know, to the things that you are doing, um, how likely, for example, a political uprising is going to be. Uh, you know, if you, elections and, and uh, you know, democratic institutions can help provide this kind of information. Um, democratic institutions can provide a very useful mechanism for channeling political discontent, keeping um, people from going out into the streets and protesting and instead channeling it in a, a useful direction through established um, uh, rules and, and procedures. Um, democracy can provide a mechanism for reconciling conflicts of interest in society in a way that can be useful for anyone trying to uh, stay in power, which usually requires achieving some <laughs> level of, uh, if not harmony, then at least reconciliation um, or, uh, of different interests. Um, and there are many other uh, uh, reasons here that we can elaborate on. But I think the larger point is that um, there is a, a significant extent to which the Russian regime, basically, they want, they want to have their democratic cake and eat it too. Um, they want to be democratic, but at the same time, they want to be sure that they always win. And of course, that's a, a fundamental contradiction. Um, but I think this is largely what leads them to develop this very elaborate system. And, and it, I think it is striking that they have gone to the lengths that they have to avoid a full-fledged authoritarian crackdown, which I think, I mean, my, my own view, I don't know what my colleagues is, but I, I think they could easily do it. If they if they had wanted to, um, but they 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 have their reasons for not wanting to, at least in the in the short run, um, and so there are several interesting elements to this uh, approach to try and basically gut democracy of the uncertainty, which is by many counts its essence, um, and one of these is to essentially find reasonable what they would consider reasonable substitutions uh, for democratic institutions, um, so where parliament is not fully functioning as a generator of ideas and a place where um, interests can be reconciled, um, where legislation can be produced, um, legislative initiative. There are a variety of other institutions that can at least provide some of these things in partial measure, but with much less political risk. So for example, the, the public chamber is one of these institutions that uh, we talk about, where it's, uh, it's, it's not a formally elected institution, um, and it's uh, basically created by uh, invitation, uh, but it starts to serve some of these functions related to uh, legislative uh, initiative, and it's become increasingly involved in the uh, process of legislation. Um, of course, when you talk about um, uh, political parties, uh, you know, I mean, there's still some of the real political parties left, like the communists, but then you have these virtual parties, as uh, they've often been called, parties like uh, Adjust Russia, um, which are clearly, I mean, they, they, they talk the language of ideology or at least of, of opposition to some degree, um, but they're headed by people with very close association with the, the, the Kremlin. So, you know, the degree to which they're actually autonomous um, is, is, of course, uh, uh, quite dubious. Um, and I think our, our general point, though, about substitutions is um, that uh, the, uh, you know, we're, we're in a sense arguing against the uh, view that these are all virtual um, institutions in the sense that this is all just one big elaborate Potemkin village. Um, but instead, they're there to play real purposes, to, um, to actually do some of the things that democratic institutions really do do. Uh, but they're an attempt to try and do that um, while avoiding the political uncertainty and the risk to um, the rulers in terms of staying in power. Um, so we're arguing that they're not facades, um, but they, they are meant to be uh, substitutions for um, democratic institutions. Um, the ways in which the regime exercises control um, are quite subtle, in, uh, certainly in comparative perspective. Um, Again, I, in the interest of time, I won't elaborate them. Plus, if you're here for the previous talk we gave, we talked about more of them, and they are uh, elaborated in the working paper. Um, but uh, we discussed there the uh, um, idea of a uh, non-participation pact 
um, being at the core of, uh, of, of what the regime is doing. So the idea being that people, uh, in exchange for not getting involved in the political process, um, are provided at least um, you know, with, with an appearance of uh, the regime actually trying to take care of their concerns and providing economic growth. Um, manipulation of the media market, again, is uh, more subtle than, it's often, um, than is often recognized. If you go to Russia, I mean, you'll see there are actually, you know, quite a wide range of publications there that you can read that uh, present a wide variety of different views. Um, even on television, one of the things we've been discussing is, I mean, you can find relatively objective news coverage on television, in particular uh, the television channel REN TV, which is available um, in most major um, urban markets, which would be precisely those markets that you would be concerned about. Um, but uh, they, they it, but very few people watch REN TV. Uh, they, very few people watch the news. Um, the ratings are relatively low, certainly compared to the state-controlled channels. And I think that you know one of the reasons that, that, that we've been talking about that they, one of the ways that they manipulate this, and, and I think Masha can talk in much more detail about this, um, is by manipulating viewers in much the way that uh, American um, media markets manipulate viewers. You get people to watch your channel through <coughs> high-quality entertainment programming, um, and then that has a big effect on what news people watch. Um, and they also take various important um, sort of insurance measures, such as uh, having friendly firms buy up these, some, you know, these apparently independent outlets so that if things ever do get out of control, you have a mechanism in place to replace the management. Um, but the bottom line is they're going to some great lengths to make sure that, uh, you know, to, to a certain extent, people don't feel um, a great lack of freedom. Uh, opinion polls of, about the Putin era, I think, show that if you ask them about personal freedom, um, people don't feel, on the whole, that um, personal freedom has declined under the Putin era. And I think these are some of the reasons uh, why. And um, the, the final element that I would uh, just emphasize here, I mean, there, there are more, is that uh, this is a system um, that has come to uh, depend very heavily on uh, what we've described as uh, manual management. Um, control is very centralized. I think in some, to some sense we could even describe the system uh, as, as micromanaged uh, democracy because um, it, it depends on the uh, rulers, in particular uh, Putin and a very close set of associates, um, intervening personally um, on very minor you know, technical uh, issues in order to um, exercise this control. Um, but at the same time, the system is built so that it's constantly recalibrating, it's constantly adjusting um, in response to new popular moods or new situations. Um, so I think what, um, in general, if we're thinking about what Medvedev's arrival uh, has meant, um, I, I would see it, and I think we see it together in, in this general light. The system itself really hasn't changed much at all. Um, but what we have seen is just um, a new type of adjustment to the new situation that we've seen in Russia, a slightly new different, a new style of management which serves certain purposes for the regime, um, and that this, uh, but, but that this capacity to adjust based on the uh, manual management of the people at the top is, uh, is, an, is an essential part of the system and is not does not represent a change in the system. Um, now, I think the fact that the presidency itself has been handed over to Medvedev does create certain tensions uh, within the system, um, but I think these are things that my uh, colleagues will uh, elaborate on. So I think that will serve by way of an introduction to uh, the topics. So um, without further ado, I'll turn things over to uh, Nikolai. Okay, thank you, Henry. Uh, I would not take Medvedev's midterm too seriously. I would rather speak about Putin's decade in power. But uh, uh, this year, uh, uh, well, I, I feel like this year is decisive. You know, there was a system uh, designed uh, during Soviet times uh, when each year or five-year plan uh, was called somehow, and the third year was called decisive, which meant that, well, it should be, uh, 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 well, finally understood whether the five-year plan uh, uh, would be realized. So uh, starting from the uh, beginning of this year, we do have a lot of interesting events, and it's possible to speak that the political life in Russia is much more intensive now than it used to be. There was uh, the State Council on Political Reform, 
there was the wave of social protests in uh, very different regions. There was this uh, very, uh, well, harsh exchange between uh, United Russia uh, functionaries and uh, first uh, uh, Sergei Mironov, the Speaker of the Upper House, and then uh, Kudrin, the Minister of Finances. There was in source uh, paper on uh, Russia, how we'd like to see it, uh, and uh, Surkov's uh, interview in Vedomosti. Uh, well, there is ongoing scandal uh, with Ministry of Interior, and uh, finally the Kremlin uh, replaced several governors' heavyweights, uh, starting the process of, uh, well, generation change uh, among, uh, among regional leaders. So I, I would read all these uh, events as a sign uh, that uh, there is growing understanding among political elites that uh, the system should be changed and that the political uh, modernization is needed uh, in order to make the system uh, well, sophisticated enough to face uh, those challenges which uh, uh, are appearing now. So speaking about governors, I would say that uh, what we see now, it's a it's very decisive moment. Uh, 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 at the very last days of uh, the last year, the final governor was replaced, who was staying in his office being elected, not appointed. So uh, more than 100 governors were replaced during this five-year uh, cycle. And uh, not only it's interesting that uh, the first, uh, well, cycle of replacement uh, uh, is, is over, it's interesting to look at how uh, uh, the share of uh, carpet baggers uh, of Varangian governors is, is growing. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's really very, uh, very uh, big now. So up to two-thirds of uh, all replacements which took place last year and a half uh, uh, was, uh, were the cases when uh, Capit Beggar was coming to replace uh, incumbent governor. And uh, not only this, but uh, strong guys uh, were, have been replaced, and uh, it looked like a kind of a punishment when first Igor Stroev, the former speaker of the uh, upper house was replaced, who <coughs> supposedly could lead uh, the governor's uh, protest. Uh, uh, it was uh, in early uh, 2009. Uh, then Yevdakimov, governor of Murmansk, uh, who, uh, well, got in public scandal uh, with the local United Russia, was replaced. Now uh, Shaimiev uh, was replaced. And uh, I, I, would, uh, I would be amazed if Yuri Lushkov and Murtaza Rahimov who are two uh, uh, last uh, heavyweights uh, who did protest against the Kremlin last year when the crisis was uh, uh, in its uh, bad shape, uh, uh, they uh, uh, will, stay, uh, will stay in office. What is interesting about these replacements, uh, it's uh, uh, not, not always uh, uh, seen, it's the fact that the Council of Federation, where majority of these guys are uh, finding their last job is becoming uh, more interesting because, you know, instead of uh, businessmen and instead of uh, 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 very strange, uh, uh, well, uh, retired persons from uh, the federal political elite, now more and more uh, former governors uh, and uh, very, uh, well, uh, heavyweight governors are coming, are coming there. Regions, it was the uh, matter of uh, the Kremlin's concern, and perhaps Masha will speak more about how they are trying to keep the balance in media between Putin and Medvedev. What strikes me is the fact that each of them did visit 34 regions last year. And, uh, uh, well, uh, I, I don't know how exactly it was calculated, but anyway, it's, uh, it's twice as much as usually Russian president, not to speak about the prime minister, is, uh, is uh, visiting. Uh, there are package firings, like Medvedev has started with firing four governors, then uh, the turn of, uh, well, uh, militia uh, generals uh, came and so on, and uh, it looks like head of bad boyars are presented to uh, uh, population sometimes. And uh, I, I would not overestimate uh, Medvedev's uh, decisiveness in comparison to Putin, but there is very interesting psychological effect, which is connected with the fact that 
Uh, Medvedev is not very happy with uh, this gap between his formal and his real role. And he tries to be uh, as cruel and as tough as possible uh, in cases where it's allowed for him. That's why he can be very harsh in uh, some discussions. And uh, I look at this as a compensation for being humiliated by his uh, senior, senior brother. Uh, where Putin and Medvedev uh, do uh, stand, I, I would say that this is not uh, absolutely not not important. And uh, 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 well, Putin, perhaps uh, he likes modernization or he doesn't like modernization, but uh, it's it's not a problem because he's not an absolute uh, tsar, and uh, he does show the balance. Uh, between major uh, elite clans. That's why if the understanding that, uh, well, uh, the system should be modernized in political sense will, uh, will come uh, to uh, elites, Putin will, will do it. And uh, I would say even more, uh, to my mind, the sooner Putin will come back to the office, uh, the better, the easier it is to wait for political modernization because now he's not in a position to benefit from uh, any kind of political changes. He did construct a very complicated system which possessed him to rule, uh, staying uh, not at the very center, at uh, the formal center of the system. That's why any political changes uh, can create, uh, create uh, or can be seen as uh, uh, damage, uh, uh, damage for him. <laughs> So United Russia, it's a it's very interesting case. You know that uh, it was humiliated many times in past, including in recent past. What is new is the plan uh, to organize eight regional conferences in each of federal districts uh, before the next uh, elections instead of national congresses. And there are two uh, explanations uh, why uh, they did accept this plan. The first is that Putin is starting his uh, campaign. And uh, it's better for him to avoid Medvedev in any role, because Medvedev should come at, uh, uh, to participate in federal Congress, but not in these regional Congresses. And, but, but second is, is different. It's like, say, bypassing of federal United Russia leadership, uh, addressing over their heads. And I would say that uh, there is a vision that United Russia, and Putin is openly showing this, is a chair to sit in and nothing else. It's not any kind of party, party of power. Uh, the dynamics of crisis uh, uh, looked very different uh, in course of the year. And uh, uh, before the government uh, decided that the crisis was over, or at least the worst phase of the crisis is over, it was much more uh, uh, well uh, eager to uh, play by more sophisticated rules of the game, elections including. And uh, now since, since last summer, it uh, became uh, sure that uh, uh, the crisis uh, is over and uh, uh, nothing, nothing uh, should, be, should be changed. So uh, to construct now the bridge between uh, what we see now and what we did describe uh, in, in our paper, I would make uh, a few uh, uh, general, uh, general points. First of all, the system is basically the same. And it's very interesting to look at how it did manage to keep uh, itself uh, 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 due to the fact that there are no institutions uh, there are substitutions, and by definition, substitutions are connected to major decision maker, to the president. And the president office was the single strong institution. Now it's not the case. So how the system did manage to do this, there, there are different ways, including so-called tandem or design. It's, it's very interesting. Look at uh, presidential councils. What did they invent? Uh, to let Putin uh, keep, keep his leverage. They did invent uh, another uh, level within the presidential councils. It's called presidium of the presidential council. So if the presidential council is led by the president, presidium is led by the prime minister, which means that uh, Putin is keeping all these working, uh, uh, well, substitutions, like, say, the Council on Local Self-Administration, 
or the Council on Sport and uh, Winter Olympics in Sochi. Uh, and Medvedev presides over this huge body which is uh, gathering uh, once a year while Putin is organizing meetings uh, uh, much, much more often. Uh, in cases when it was impossible to do this, like in case of uh, Presidium of the State Council, which is chaired by the president, Putin did create clones. Uh, there is his own commission on regions, uh, consisting of top uh, governmental officials and some regional leaders. But unlike uh, pre uh, presidiums, uh, where uh, regional leaders are rotated uh, each half a year, uh, in this Putin's uh, new commission, uh, he himself is defining who exactly out of regional leaders should participate in, in, the next, in the next meeting. And the latest development, you've heard Putin uh, is now chairing the Commission on Innovations. And uh, 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 no more, Medvedev uh, uh, has his monopoly. By the way, uh, Medvedev's Commission on Modernization is his brainchild and is the single uh, well, substitution of the single uh, body which appeared and which is working pretty, pretty actively. If, uh, if uh, you'll be interested, I, I will describe it in details, uh, uh, answering questions. So environment is very different, and that's, that's the problem. The system is pretty the same. Uh, environment challenges are different. The social contract uh, uh, is still in place, although more and more often we can see some signs telling that uh, no more non-participation is uh, preferable for population because they do not see anything in exchange. Uh, there, is, uh, there are challenges connected with the fact that the system is facing now more and more uh, problems, problems at different levels, and it didn't manage to work out any, any systemic uh, response, so there are uh, uh, cases when manual management is used, but it can work in case of one Pikalova, one Baikalsk, but if only these cases will uh, become more numerous, uh, it, will be, uh, it will be no more possible to drive uh, in, in this way. And the most important problem is connected with the fact that the time now is running much faster. Uh, decisions should be made uh, faster. And this creates very serious problem because uh, the way how Putin avoided having the mechanism of checks and balances was connected with time. Uh, he was uh, not making decision for pretty long time, allowing each side to reach him, and uh, there was a kind of quasi-checks and balances mechanism how uh, interests of different elite groups uh, could, be, could be balanced. No more it works, and more and more often we can see that decision was made, it was announced, and uh, after, after this announcement the real competition is starting, uh, leading to either revision of the decision or postponement of decision and so on. So I would say that uh, there are almost no cases of uh, final decisions, final serious decisions made uh, uh, in, in, in recent uh, uh, political past, although there are numerous cases of uh, bad, bad decision uh, making. So uh, I would finish with saying that uh, illusion uh, that the crisis uh, is almost over is pretty widespread uh, in Russia at the federal level, uh, first of all, although the problem is uh, still there. I would say that the crisis was postponed, and that's, uh, that's a major problem, not the fact that uh, the government spent this or that amount of money. It spent this money in order not to fix the problem, but to postpone the problem. And uh, it can be easily seen uh, uh, in case of regions. You know, last year, regional budgets used to be in a pretty good shape. In some regions, they used to be even bigger than in 2008 <laughs> due to the fact that the Kremlin was afraid of social unrest and they were eager to give more and more money to regions. It's no more the case. Uh, the money is over, or at least the money for regions is over. And uh, unlike the last year when uh, the crisis was felt most of all in most developed regions, those regions which didn't depend from the federal budget, 
uh, they lost their incomes and they didn't get anything or, or almost uh, didn't get anything in exchange. But those regions, majority of them, which were subsidized by the federal budget, felt not, not that bad. Now it's not the case. There are cuts off uh, and uh, uh, their, their budgets are now in uh, much uh, worse uh, 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 shape. Not to speak about the fact that, uh, well, how uh, these budgets addressed the crisis. They did refuse from all spendings except for paying salaries and pensions, which means that they didn't invest, they didn't, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, pay for uh, communal services, and uh, uh, it means that problems were accumulating. And what we saw last year in case of, uh, well, technical catastrophes uh, in uh, Sayana Shushinska, I guess, in Perm, uh, in Ulyanovsk, and in some other cases, well, uh, Ministries were uh, different, uh, particular reasons why it happened were different, but generally speaking, it demonstrated that the whole system of management uh, uh, didn't work uh, uh, well effectively. And uh, it means that reset is really deadly needed for the uh, political system, for the managerial system, first of all. And I would say that there are more and more signs that uh, it's understood by at least uh, uh, some of uh, political elites in the country. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. Always a great pleasure to be here. My focus today um, is the media. Uh, and uh, I will focus, just as Nikolai, will focus more on the more recent developments than on um, how actually the media was taken under control. Uh, of course, it was uh, taken under control during Putin's term, and this control um, is quite refined. Um, very roughly, it may be described as consisting of two major elements, one being the federal news channels that are tightly controlled by the Kremlin, and outside of the federal TV channels, as Henry mentioned, there is, of course, free expression, and uh, some media outlets uh, have used this opportunity. Uh, and this includes print, web, radio, TV, red TV in particular that Henry mentioned. The second element of control, however, is that um, in the absence of political competition and of checks and balances, uh, the existing degree of editorial independence mm, has been incapable to undermine the political monopoly of the ruling elite. Now, the emergence of Medvedev called for an adjustment of the media controls, uh, most obviously because national television coverage um, that was tuned to one dominant political figure had to accommodate two. Um, actually, this task proved to be a very easy one and uh, was fairly smooth. Um, both, uh, uh, both figures feature very prominently on state channels. Um, it, it invariably gets more time. Um, and uh, otherwise, uh, the, the operation has been very smooth. It is noteworthy that controlled television is an invaluable polit political resource that is shared by both Putin and Medvedev. This resource is so critically important that for all his talk about freedom, non-freedom, freedom more important than non-freedom, rule of law is important, etc., Medvedev has never challenged the operation of federal channels. In fact, early in his, in his term, he told a Russian weekly paper that, I quote, in its quality and the means used, Russian television is among the best in the world, and it is not pro-government. Um, now, um, um, Nikolai was talking about the change environment. Um, I would say that the main feature about change environment as far as the media realm is concerned is an expansion of free expression. And one way uh, to look at, uh, at this change is uh, as evidence of the system's flexibility and capacity for adjustment that uh, Henry was talking about. The Kremlin's main concern remains to adjust to the changed environment and uh, avoid unpleasant so social developments, yet to do so in a way uh, so as not to yield any of the decision-making power. Um, here's a quote to illustrate the expanded uh, freedom of expression. I quote, we do everything upside down. Everywhere in the world, political parties shape political opinion in a pool of political cadre. And in our country, bureaucrats put together party slates, organize elections, and issue assessments of elections. I will never believe that the majority of the Russian electorate want to vote for just one party. People do not want a monopoly. Monopoly in democracy leads automatically to a monopoly in the economy. And if we keep the monopoly, we will never overcome corruption. 
20 years ago in the Kremlin, it was said, enough for the one-party monopoly. Let us live up to this good tradition. End of quote. Now, who do you think is the author of this manifesto of freedom and democracy? Uh, it is Russia's veteran liberal democrat, Vladimir Zhirinovsky. <laughs> Uh, Zhirinovsky has superb political intuition, and if he's talking about political pluralism, etc., he likely knows what he's doing. <laughs> what is more interesting is the venue where this praise of contested elections took place. Zhirinovsky delivered this speech at a session of Gossoviet State Council that Nikolai mentioned. This is a body that includes all Russian uh, governors. And uh, uh, to discuss political reform, uh, um, uh, party leaders were invited. The transcript of the meeting is posted on the official Kremlin website for everyone to see. So the Kremlin website now has become, if they're near, yet another outlet of criticism and free expression. Um, Earlier this year, uh, early last year, um, the Council on uh, Civil Society and Human Rights also met with the president, and its members were fairly radical in their criticism of the authoritarian practices. The issue of rigged elections was also raised, and solid evidence was presented by a political expert who also happens to write venomous op-eds in opposition media. His evidence is currently posted on the official Kremlin website, uh, as is the full transcript of the meeting. Just as Putin before him, Medvedev holds regular meetings with top editors of the Russian media. The meetings themselves are off the record, just as Putin's were, but unlike the meetings with his mentor or predecessor, uh, with Medvedev, uh, the meetings are more informal and friendly. According to some of the part participants, the editors ask challenging questions, including those about the decline of democracy, um, especially uh, whether Russia should probably return uh, uh, to gubernatorial elections instead of appointments. Uh, they also asked about lawyer uh, Magnitsky, who represented an American investment banker and died in jail because of malicious mistreatment allegedly aimed at forcing him to calumniate his client. Other examples of uh, broad uh, uh, freedom of expression. Uh, for example, the report uh, that Nikolai already mentioned by the Institute of Modern Development, a think tank associated with President Medvedev, uh, Medvedev happens to be the chair of the board of trustees of, of this think tank. The report, which paints a picture of Russia's desired future, is strongly focused on political shift toward a freer, plural, uh, more democratic political system. Also, the media outlets that have pursued independent editorial lines all along uh, seem to have gotten bol bolder over the past year or so. I would especially single out the debate over modernization and the criticism of a technological or Soviet-style modernization as opposed to a more radical so social and political modernization. This debate goes on on the pages of Russian print media, also on the web, uh, on the radio, um, and um, um, it, is, it is an ongoing debate. Even the federal news channels that are still tightly controlled by the government have become a bit more lighthearted with regard to the top figures. Channel One has launched a couple shows for younger audiences, and in these shows, uh, top policymakers are sometimes treated with a degree of irony. Uh, um, the New York Times around the New Year time wrote about uh, a puppet show in which pu puppets of Putin and Medvedev, unheard of in the previous several years, appeared on the screen. Um, of course, this is but a speculative suggestion that uh, the expanded media freedom is the Kremlin's response to the potential risks generated by the economic crisis in the dual center of power. But by way of supporting this speculation, consider the words of Gleb Pavlovsky, one of the Kremlin's best informed insiders. This is a quote. The most serious lack of success Putin had was in his work with minorities. I mean intellectuals, creative groups, innovators, and so on. He was interested in creating a majority, and to a considerable degree, he neglected these small spheres, neglected the dialogue with them. And this created a certain vacuum that began to be filled with radical conceptions and radical activists. That is this, uh, it, it is the state that has been acknowledged, but society hasn't, and the unacknowledged society has become a problem. It may be argued that in broadening the space for free expression, the Kremlin had the same rationale that underlined uh, Putin's original choice of Medvedev. The choice of Medvedev obviously made quite a number of requirements, but one of them likely was a desire to attract those minorities, uh, those same minorities that had been antagonized by Putin's authoritarian policies and uh, hard, somewhat hawkish bearing. 
In this framework, Medvedev's job may be generally seen as that of reaching out to or appeasing or softly co-opting those unacknowledged, to use the expression of Pavlovsky, but vocal minorities, which theoretically might emerge as a challenge um, to state authority. These activists and media professionals may not be gullible or naive, but Medvedev hardly means to re-educate them or turn them into loyalists. The regime is much too flexible for such straightforward pressure. Its goal is more modest. After letting off steam in a meeting with the head of state, they are le less likely to join with, uh, again to use the expression of Pavlovsky, the radical conceptions and radical activists. It's not that there is imminent danger of political experts, media community, or human rights activists to join the ranks of uh, Limonov and uh, Geir Kasparov and topple the regime. Rather, the Kremlin is trying to foresee and preempt undesired political development. Um, so critics uh, in the political establishment, expert community, etc., would not get too carried away by the talk about political reform, like in Gossoviet or the, uh, uh, the, the Medvedev's uh, think tank. There, uh, there, there are cautionary signals coming all the time from the decision-making make, level. At the end of uh, the State Council session, Putin threw some cold water. According to rumors, he, he appeared at this meeting unexpectedly. His tone was harsh and peppered with his uh, uh, trademark colorful lingo. The political system, he said, should have a degree of sound conservative and shouldn't be shaking as a piece of jelly. He denied that the United Russia monopolized the political scene and dismissed any allegations of election rigging. He angrily waved off stories of election rigging posted on the web that were, uh, were mentioned by one of the party leaders. 50% of the web, he said, is porn stuff. Why would any, anybody pay attention to it? <laughs> now, speaking of uh, humiliation that Medvedev goes through, this remark is noteworthy because Medvedev not only has his own blog, but uh, always emphasizes that he is a, f a fan of the web. <laughs> Uh, to those who may have been inspired by Medvedev's sharp criticism of the state affairs in Russia in his address to the parliament last year, the president had a warning in the end. Any attempt to use democratic slogans to destabilize the situation, the government, and to split society will be prevented. Harsh treatment of political rallies in Moscow, as well as a number of additional police measures uh, recently enacted or under consideration today, suggest that the government is prepared to draw on hard away ways to hedge against social discontent. The Kremlin powerful political aide, Vladislav Surkov, added his own cautionary signal. Uh, Nikolai mentioned his interview that he gave. It's a rare interview he gave to a liberal business daily, Vyadomosti. Um, uh, and uh, uh, he said that in 2011, United Russia will win because it is good for modernization. The system should be preserved, he said, it shouldn't be rejected. We shouldn't let in anything that can destroy it. Surkov's interview is a good example of how ind independent media are used not just to let off steam of the critically minded, but also as a kind of a bulletin board for the elites uh, where they can exchange messages with each other. Surkov's interview outlined a vision of modernization led by the state that would remain an uncontested decision maker. Indeed, as Surkov said in the interview, unwelcome forces are not let in. Yablaka party was barred from participation in local elections to be held next week in the same heavy-handed fashion that was previously used to ensure the monopoly of United Russia. Sometimes, however, the expanded freedom of expression has an appearance of a genuine fresh freedom. Consider the endless stream of publications about police violence in all kinds of media, including federal television. After a horrible inc incident a year ago when a drunk policeman opened fire in a Moscow supermarket killing two and injuring seven, there has been a flurry of reports about rape, torture, and murder by policemen. Seemingly in response to these reports, President Medvedev announced a police reform. Its first steps were made public a short while ago. What makes this development, however, distinctly different from free press operation is the path from media reports to an executive decision. The latter is made in a non-transparent fashion and is not preceded or mediated by an institutionalized discussion. Of course, in the limited realm of independent media, discussion goes on all the time. 
In the case of the police reform, there can be no institutionalized discussion of the causes of this dramatic degradation of law enforcement or whether it might be in some way related to the political system, uh, which rules out public accountability. Nor is there an institutionalized discussion of whether the measures suggested by the president would indeed help improve the performance of the police. A genuine political discussion of this sort might have unpredictable consequences for the incumbent power. And unpredictability or uncertainty, as Henry put it, is exactly the factor that Putin's Kremlin had securely eliminated during his presidency. So the Kremlin may use the independent media reports to send a message that the government is aware of problems and takes care of them. But the leadership still remains unaccountable, media operation notwithstanding. As a result, the stream of reports about uh, police abuse looks more like a campaign, an example of hybrid regime finesse, than an, as an institutionalized free press operation, even if quite a few reporters take genuine effort to cover ugly practices of the police. So far, the Kremlin elaborate practices have been effective, and the ruling elite remains essentially unchallenged. But in some cases, expressions of public anger has an impact and can even produce accountability. Just last week, two women were killed in a car crash in Moscow, uh, which involved the chauffeured Mercedes car of the vice president of Lukoil. <coughs> According to witnesses, the fatal accident was caused by the Mercedes driver. A high-ranking executive like, <coughs> like this is sure to have good connections uh, that should um, would, uh, uh, make, uh, would enable him to escape responsibility. The oil company immediately announced that the chauffeur did nothing wrong, and there are reasons to believe that initially the police helped them hide some of the evidence. The blogosphere responded with an explosion of outrage. Russian Association of Automobile Drivers called for witnesses to show up, and four people in, indeed showed and volunteered to, uh, uh, to testify. The same association threatened to boycott Luke Oil gas stations. A popular rap singer wrote an angry song about the accident, which immediately gained broad popularity on the web. A left-wing political group announced that it would stage a picket, demanding uh, a fair investigation of the accident. <coughs> the story is not over, but already the police was forced to make public the images of the accident recorded by a street video camera. If the Luke Oil executive is indeed to blame, he'll hardly get away with impunity. In a similar accident five years ago, the son of the then Minister of Defense, Sergei Ivanov, went unpunished after a fatal car accident in which he ran over um, an elderly woman. Of course, there's a long way from such an episode to a public demand for government accountability, but some effect of free expression is undeniable. Uh, and the web that Putin so easily dismissed as a pouring outlet uh, may play a bigger role in the future if more elections are rigged or um, as accumulating problems and policy failures generate discontent that the government will find in increasingly hard to quash. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, I think now I'd like to turn to the audience and let you... Uh, come up with what you would digest of this. So in the back, could you identify yourself and uh, <clears throat> use the microphone? Yes, hello, uh, Dr. Katarzyna Pisarska. I'm the director of the European Academy of Diplomacy in Warsaw, Poland. I'm also a visiting scholar here at the Center for Transatlantic Studies at SAIS. Uh, I have two questions, one to, to, to Mr. Pietrov and one to Mrs. Uh, Lipman. Uh, you spoke about the financial crisis and a lot uh, of us believed at some point that because Russia was so much hit by the crisis that w it would in fact exige some kind of deep reforms of the country uh, and that there would be some kind of social unrest with the changing situation. You spoke about the government policies at the moment trying to kind of uh, push this crisis forward, but uh, what are the, the, the public opinions? What are the feelings? Has the crisis affected uh, uh, average citizen of Moscow or any other city in the country? And my question to Ms. Lipman concerns more uh, civil society and the state. How would you assess the state of the non-governmental sector 
here at the moment. But I'm uh, mainly concerned about that unpopular among the uh, government uh, NGO sec sector that deals with democracy promotion, what deals with, with all those issues that are, of course, uncomfortable for the current Russian uh, administration because, of course, other NGOs across the country do get financial support from, from the government and have often a very good relationship with the government. So I'm interested mainly in those who have been in some way prosecuted. And to the both of you, how does the Carnegie Center deal with the new administration? Has the tension increased, lessened? <laughs> what has changed in these two years for you? Thank you. Kolya, you want to begin? Okay. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, a year ago, there was huge discussion about this non-participation pact uh, Henry mentioned. Uh, and uh, it was understandable that if the government no more was considered to be in a position to increase salaries, pensions, and to provide uh, uh, increasing life level and so on, then uh, there were expectations that uh, uh, social unrest or at least uh, political uh, activism will increase essentially. It never happened this way partly due to the fact that the government did its best uh, in order to avoid this, and uh, it uh, continued to spend huge money, which uh, amidst the crisis was read as perhaps Putin's plan even to organize early elections, because you know that starting from January 1st this year, uh, pensions has been increased very essentially, and uh, it uh, creates very uh, serious burden for uh, uh, the budget. But uh, I would say that uh, although the social contract uh, is uh, still in place, uh, there are more and more signs that uh, it doesn't uh, work that well. And uh, we could see this a year ago in Vladivostok when there was uh, massive social unrest caused by the uh, governmental decision which didn't uh, take into account regional uh, regional interest. But starting from uh, uh, this January, we can see a growing wave of social unrest. In each particular case, uh, it uh, can be explained by different reasons, by environmental reasons in Irkutsk, by economic crisis and uh, bad governance uh, in uh, Kaliningrad, uh, by some uh, communal uh, problems in Arkhangelsk and so on. And so on. What is, what is uh, uh, common in all these cases is, first of all, the fact that there are uh, carpet baggers governors, which means that uh, against the background of uh, growing instability, it's much easier for those guys to cause huge personal uh, hatred and uh, reaction and to cause this social unrest. And it puts the Kremlin into a very complicated position, either to replace these guys, showing uh, uh, its weakness and uh, uh, answering uh, these social protests, or to keep them in power and to face additional problems connected with uh, bad, bad management. So I would say that if the last year, the last year was perhaps the last uh, when uh, this social contract was in place, and now we see that uh, it's over. Uh, uh, in, well, speaking about our, uh, our relationship with uh, authorities, I would say that uh, Medvedev uh, is the guy who did visit Carnegie Moscow Center 10 years ago. At the time, he was uh, campaigning for Putin. Since that time, all our attempts to uh, attract anybody from uh, this team uh, failed. And in last presidential elections, we got Zhirinovsky, we got uh, person number two from Communist Party, but none of uh, those guys, including our personal uh, acquaintance, uh, appeared to present uh, Medvedev's, uh, Medvedev's views. But uh, that's all. So I would say that... Uh, uh, they aren't uh, very focused on what uh, uh, we are doing, uh, if especially to speak about our programs, and uh, we are not taking care a lot about uh, about them. Um, well, I think one uh, one reason why uh, we do not see the big change in the public mindset that was probably expected uh, in late 2008 is because oil is at around $80 per barrel, not 40 And the government still has the capacity to buy the compliance of the people, which it effectively does. Uh, as a result, even uh, in spite of all those protests that are, I think, gaining steam right now, the overall numbers of the uh, approval 
uh, by the Russian people as seen in the polls remains very high and what is uh, even more in, more important it's set, it's steady it's around 80 percent just under well 75 to 80 82 for both men usually uh, always uh, Putin is slightly ahead and Medvedev tracks him like they go in two parallel tracks um, um, now um, uh, uh, talking about uh, talking about um, NGOs. Um, well, as you rightly mentioned, uh, Medvedev. By the way, Medvedev, not Putin, differentiated between two categories of uh, um, NGOs in Russia: those that are socially oriented, or as we probably should read it, those who do not mess up with politics, and others. Uh, the group of socially oriented recently uh, also accommodated. Uh, uh, religious NGOs, which was a big concession to the church. The church also wanted uh, financial support for its own <coughs> non-governing organizations. Um, um, I would say the situation for um, more politically oriented, I'm not sure how to put it, maybe not socially oriented, but more politically oriented NGO has hardly changed. Uh, they could never mm, expect the government to, to show benevolence. The environment has been not friendly for them, but not to a point. The regime, again, I would emphasize what Henry said is sophisticated and subtle. It would not directly attack NGOs for very rare exceptions, uh, and those exceptions usually happen locally when the authorities are uh, more heavy-handed, less sophisticated than they were in Moscow. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's basically the same way. I would say put straightforwardly is democracy promotion. Uh, I don't think such organizations uh, can hope for to achieve much in Russia, but those uh, that do very concrete things like civil litigations, like uh, against torture, um, all sorts of, well, I will not go into, into the list. Soldiers, mothers, of course, is a very prominent example. Uh, and all the major ones remain in place. Um, um, Helsinki, uh, Helsinki, Helsinki Watch, Human Rights, Human Rights Watch, um, Memorial, all the big uh, major veteran organizations that have been on the scene for about two decades are all there, all reliant on foreign financing and all um, are doing good work, and uh, I can't see um, how this, this, this would change. Um, I'm not sure what you meant by saying uh, an organization that was prosecuted. I think maybe there were very few cases in the provinces, but it never, um, it never ad ended dramatically. So um, I, I don't think that the, the, the environment is that unfriendly for non-government non organizations. Um, uh, and just one more word um, to add to what Nicola said about the, uh, the rallies, the protest rallies, that indeed are quite, quite uh, impressive and uh, have been quite a lot. And for March 20, uh, people in Kaliningrad, uh, who so far were able to stage the biggest rally in Russia, <laughs> Uh, um, the biggest in a decade, uh, uh, promised that they would bring 20,000, so we'll see. Uh, however, I would want to emphasize that this is not a movement, rather a mood. Uh, there are no clear political demands except for very emotional, like Putin should go out, but not a glimpse of who should go in and what they actually want, except for uh, very limited local causes uh, of socioeconomic nature. Bob. Bob Kaiser, The Washington Post. I, I too have questions for both uh, Nikolai and Masha. Nikolai, you, you talked about the polls that show that Russians feel that they're free, and I, I know this from personal experience too. It's hard to get anyone uh, on the street to say, no, we're, we're prisoners of this new regime. What's the danger that this sense of being free might actually become a temptation in some unforeseen today, unforeseen circumstance to actually act free in a political context. Uh, I, I think there's an interesting psychological issue here. If, if indeed, and I think it's true, <coughs> citizens say, you know, it's, it's not, it's not what it was. It's a different kind of a country. We are free. We travel. We do this with it. That they might start to want to do things differently. What's the danger for the regime? And Masha, I'd love you to speculate. I know you can't only speculate on the decision-making process that led to the de fact that you described of Medvedev always getting a little more time on the evening news than Putin. And, how, and what's the danger that that confuses people? What's, how do ordinary people understand that? Uh, what, what, how would they interpret it? Kolya? 
Uh, I would start with saying that uh, if it's possible to wait uh, for serious troubles for the regime this year, these troubles will be caused by the regime itself uh, rather than by uh, political opposition or by uh, mass uh, protests, uh, which will be not inspired by uh, 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 the regime uh, making making serious mistakes. And uh, it leads me to, to elections. And this is, I think, very, very important point. Uh, you know, uh, in, in a week from now, we'll have uh, elections in more than 70 regions. And uh, in some cases, well, uh, the way authorities are, uh, uh, well, uh, behaving in elections is absolutely the same as they used to behave uh, last October when causing huge scandals, at least, if not mass protests, connected with electoral fraud in Moscow City Duma elections and in some other cases. And uh, I, I did publish today a piece on elections in Moscow Times, and let me uh, uh, tell you about one uh, very uh, demonstrative story which is going on in Irkutsk. Irkutsk is a large-scale Siberian town where uh, we did already have uh, uh, many cases of uh, mass protest movement connected uh, to environmental issues, first of all. What they do have now, they uh, did uh, send there the governor, Kapit Berger, uh, who originated from St. Petersburg. And when the guy came to town, his first move was to avoid any kind of political competition. And in order to do this, he sent uh, the former mayor of Irkutsk as his representative to the Council of Federation. The uh, uh, position is vacant and uh, elections are going on. What they did uh, decide, in order not to have strong governor, they did invite the guy from Bratsk, which is from the same region, but uh, it's uh, one hour and a half by plane, and it's uh, uh, well known for criminal business and for Deripaska's presence. So the guy from Bratsk is uh, uh, strongly connected with both. Uh, so he was appointed active uh, mayor of Irkutsk, and it did already create very strong uh, uh, social protest, and uh, it was uh, this decision which consolidated opposition. So everybody is fighting now in Irkutsk against this uh, carpet burger. Uh, who was appointed by another carpet beggar, their present uh, governor. And uh, how did they react? They've seen sociological polls told that uh, the guy uh, is, uh, has 10% popularity. So they did uh, push out uh, the uh, more popular candidate uh, on the ground that his signatures were uh, invalid. They did discover this uh, in, ten day, in 10 days before the voting. And uh, that's, that's an interesting case because, you know, Medvedev all the time was saying that, well, elections uh, are somehow going on. They are not uh, perfect, uh, but we should make them better. And uh, that's why I would say the damage for Medvedev's reputation, if only elections uh, in a week, Will, uh, will be held in a way uh, they were held uh, uh, in, uh, well, uh, last, last fall, it, it, it would create very serious damage. Until now, there was damage for Medvedev's reputation here in the West or uh, somewhere else, but not uh, in eyes of uh, ordinary, ordinary citizens. And this is uh, the clear example how the problem can be created uh, without without any real reasons, but due to the fact that, well, first, the uh, Varangian governor was appointed, he, he had free hand uh, to do whatever he wanted, and there wasn't any kind of mechanism, foolproof mechanism, to prevent him from doing these stupid things. Um. Well, on the issue of uh, how time and television is di distributed, actually there was a uh, fairly good description of it, uh, which was not merely speculative, in uh, Russian <coughs> Newsweek in the summer of 2008, how, the, uh, uh, how state television is accommodating two people instead of one. Um, this is a sophisticated operation that is run jointly by uh, top TV managers of the federal channels and uh, some in the Kremlin administration. Uh, they used to uh, meet um, 
weekly on Fridays. I was told that this is no longer the practice, but now they are on the phone all the time. But television managers are such savvy uh, uh, figures themselves that they can figure out what's, what's the right thing to do. So I think uh, uh, because the real authority is with, uh, this is pure speculation, the real authority is with Medvedev, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the real authority is with Putin. Uh, Medvedev is given the formal vestiges. And one of them being, he should have more time on television. Um, the best Russian mainstream daily, Kommersant, runs a daily gorging of time on air of both people. So you can tell that for very, very rare exceptions, um, Medvedev gets more time. However, uh, uh, in the polls, when people <coughs> are asked who's got more authority, uh, the most common answer is the authority is equally divided between the two, which is the message that is being sent, that they are friends and that they are a good tandem. About 50% believe that uh, the authority is divided equally. However, uh, those who think that it is not divided equally, um, uh, three times more people think that the authority lies with Putin. Uh, and about 11 or 12 percent uh, think that the authority lies with Medvedev. So they're not only based on the time on air and on the attention uh, that, uh, that Medvedev um, is given. Uh, and just one more remark about freedom, how people say they're free. Uh, um, um, one of Russia's best sociologists, Boris Dubin of Levader Center, uh, wrote a piece not a long time ago trying to interpret what, uh, how freedom is understood in this case. And it is not about we have the freedom to travel, to vote, to whatever, uh, rather he describes as a paternalistic freedom, the freedom of responsibility. Uh, Non-participation uh, pact as we described it. The freedom not to bear the burden of citizenship, if you like, of, of sharing the burden of decision making with the government. Actually, this is accepted and is accepted with relief. Ariel, you. Uh, we wait for the mic. Ariel Cohen, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, you're describing uh, basically a slight rise in discontent. It's, it's an emotional situation, it's an emotional condition. As somebody said, it's, uh, it's not a movement, it's a mood. If you extrapolate and look at the weak points in the system, where are those weak points? What can give, what can crack? And if it cracks, A, what kind of response the system will have? Will it show fangs or will it accommodate, uh, incorporate those who may lead protests, Nikita Bilik or whoever? Uh, and the second issue is you did not mention any alternative elites. Who are they? Are these people in the Erzatz parties or are they somewhere else? I'm not talking about uh, Kasparov and people like that, but are the people that are not are the people that are not in front that we, we're not talking about who may come to power, and if so, who are they? What kind of power they will exercise? Thank you. Uh, well, I suspect that full answer. Uh, yeah, would take another uh, hour or so. So. Starting with weak points, I would say that there are almost no strong points. And, uh, uh, well, we are dealing with all these weaknesses in, 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 this, uh, in this publication. And uh, I would say that uh, they are uh, almost uh, the same now as they used to be, except for one very important thing. You know, I am telling all the time that uh, the tandem is very formal uh, 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 way to describe uh, this regime in a sense that Medvedev doesn't play any, any important role at all. Uh, the problem is that uh, even formally being uh, the president of Russia, he uh, creates certain troubles for the system. And I would say that uh, the system uh, would carry either tandem or the crisis, but it cannot carry both uh, in more or less uh, uh, effective way. That's why I would say that this is too much, and uh, that's why I, I think uh, that, uh, uh, well, uh, rather sooner than later, uh, the old uh, state of affairs uh, will be restored. It doesn't mean necessarily that Putin will... Uh, well, I, I think that uh, he, he'll come back uh, to the office. Uh, 
What will be the response? Well, I'm not counting on any good guys coming to replace bad guys. I would say that, to my mind, Putin uh, could be much better if being restricted uh, in, in, in a harsher way. So I am speaking about restrictions. I am speaking about rules of the game. I am speaking uh, about, uh, uh, well, the need to strengthen institutions rather than to replace uh, 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 well, bad, bad guys. So they are bad because uh, they are allowed to be bad and they will be much better if only we should restrict them in harsher, in harsher way. There are no alternative elites at all. So uh, uh, political parties and, well, uh, Henry uh, did uh, publish a book about uh, uh, why not parties in Russia. Uh, they aren't playing any any real role, and uh, especially the role of uh, growing uh, growing alternative political elites. So alternative political elites are uh, are, are there. So it's it's not uh, it's not uh, uh, about uh, uh, well personal uh, shifts and personal changes. It's more about institutional changes, which either can be brought by the system itself if it's capable to react onto new challenges and it's capable to make itself more sophisticated, or it uh, can be done in, 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 in harsher way but with the same, uh, with the same persons. Okay. I mean, I, I just briefly say in terms of the, the weak points of the regime, um, <laughs> I mean, I think the way these types of systems tend to break down uh, comes from splits in the elites, uh, most of all. And in, in this particular case, um, you know, one, one of the most obvious times for when uh, elite unity can break down are uh, secession crises. Um, so I think, I mean, I think that has a lot to do with the, the, the caution that, uh, you know, I mean, it's a very, it was a very complicated process sort of handing off the presidency to Medvedev without trying to create the appearance that there was a, a succession crisis, but I think that was a very delicate <laughs> moment. Um, but, you know, at some point down the line, I think that's where um, a lot of the weakness happens. Um, but I think the other point is that um, I think public opinion has played an important role um, helping to preserve elite unity in, in this regime because um, right now, if anyone tried to break away from, uh, you know, say the Putin regime and tried to mobilize public opinion against it, it would be very hard for them to do because I think, you know, the, the popularity of the system makes it very, very difficult for them to do it. And um, so I think over the long run, you know, deteriorating public support for um, the regime can have a very real uh, impact on the system, weakening it, providing incentives for different elites to start playing their own games in a much more direct way. And the points at which that's most likely to happen, I think, will be during um, elections. And so, uh, you know, and most likely nationwide elections when everybody's focused on it, um, and most likely when you have presidential elections. Um, and I think, therefore, the pres preservation of elections and the possibility of at least some real opposition competing um, you know, gives public opinion this extra um, role to play uh, in the regime because it's at those points that it can be mobilized um, by uh, competing uh, elites. And so I think, you know, we have to think seriously about, um, you know, what the sources of, of public support for are the regime um, and uh, what, uh, you know, what are the situations under which it might seriously change. Um, you know, so far the regime has not shown um, the willingness to run roughshod over public opinion. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, I mean, the crisis showed that just an economic collapse, just kind of a one-off thing, isn't going to completely undermine the support in the system. I think they have a lot of reserves of support built up, um, but it doesn't mean that can change. I think over time, economic performance, um, if it slows down, you know, it'll start to erode, people will start thinking that, well, um, the novelty of economic growth at a certain point starts to wear off and people start expecting more. Um, there's a possibility of fatigue, just kind of Putin fatigue. Uh, I think we're seeing some of that now. I mean, I think that's a, a good part of what's behind some of these, you know, individualistic uh, protests. Um, so, I mean, I guess I don't expect anything to happen soon, but at least in terms of where the system is likely to change, I think the pressure points are succession struggles, in particular elections, and it'll be brought to a head uh, you know, if, if public opinion really starts to, um, you know, deteriorate, in which case there's, you know, um, you know le less obvious support for the uh, incumbents. Okay. Marvin? Uh, Marvin Kalb with the Shorenstein Center at Harvard. My question is not so much about Putin and Medvedev as their staffs. It is natural in a vibrant political system for staffs to become very loyal to the boss. 
to represent the boss's views, uh, to discuss them. Now, is there any evidence at all that among the staffs there is the beginning of some kind of discussion that my boss has a better idea than yours and uh, discuss those things with reporters and deliberately seek to propagate difference. Yeah, there is actually plenty of evidence of this sort. And uh, I mean, you described it very accurately. <laughs> um, there is indeed, there are indeed tensions between the staffs. And uh, there are especially notorious struggles going on. And people with knowledge who keep track of the developments can see the uh, um, outward reflections of what uh, um, is, 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 is seen to be the, the, uh, the conflicts, the tensions uh, within. Um, there are obvious uh, jealousies among people who work for Medvedev, who work for the president of Russia, extremely powerful job, and yet are inferior either to uh, those from Putin's administration who were left behind either to help the uh, new and inexperienced president or to, uh, uh, to exercise surveillance over him and who are seen as senior to those people who are uh, heavily emerged in the administration under, under Medvedev. And uh, whenever there is a, an overlapping of authority, uh, there, emerge, uh, there emerge tensions. And this is even seen in the legislative process. Uh, it is seen how uh, uh, a, a bill made in the government, in the cabinet, and uh, a bill made in the administration uh, uh, overlap and collide. And uh, in a very uh, uh, graphic case just recently, there was, uh, there was a bill, there was a trade bill, an obvious conflict between manufacturers and retailers um, that uh, uh, the Duma voted for, and it was, uh, uh, it was the president's bill, more or less. But then, in a very scandalous fashion, the Duma was forced to uh, overturn its own decision uh, in a dubious uh, procedural way. Um, we just showed that the cabinet has more authority because Putin is there and uh, his, his priority in the conflict was different. Okay. Andre? Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to you in a second. Um, uh, I have a question to Henry. Um, Henry, you mentioned uh, at the very beginning that this regime could be called as hybrid regime. And you compare it with Singapore, but you have said that it probably it's not fully comparable due to size and due to some other uh, features of both regimes. And we also can say that, okay, qualitatively, level of civil liberties or political rights by those indicators, uh, current Russia and Singapore are just walled apart. Uh, what other hybrid regimes or any other regimes you would mention as similar to the current political regime in Russia? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, part of the study is premised on the idea that Russia is kind of unique. It's kind of at the cutting edge of what one might call hybrid regime uh, technology in the sense of the degree of elaborateness of its uh, apparatus for preserving its, its hybrid nature. But I mean, you know, there's, there's certainly other regimes that resemble it, uh, you know, a number of them in the former Soviet space, um, you know, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, um, you know, Armenia, Azerbaijan, you know, to some degree, uh, Belarus are similar, but they're much less sophisticated in the way that they um, sort of balance the, uh, you know, the, the, the suppression or the, uh, you know, balance the removal of uncertainty from the system with the, uh, you know, the, the relative lack of, you know, sort of harsh, um, you know, author the most authoritarian uh, methods. So, I mean, you know, in the post-Soviet cases, I mean, there are, there are a number of regimes like that. Um, you know, to some degree, I mean, one could put, I mean, you know, all these countries are different, but in, in terms of hybrid regimes that combine um, elements of, of, of uh, democracy and autocracy, I mean, you know, typically people point to countries like Tanzania, um, you know, Venezuela, uh, you know, Iran to some degree, you know, represents a, a kind of a hybrid system where control is, is you know, is still concentrated. Um, you know, of course, they're the top authorities aren't actually uh, elected in anything, um, but, uh, but they still have some kind of competitive elections. So, you know, the, I think there are a number of cases worldwide that, uh, you know, that, that are, I mean, you know, by most studies, the countries in the hybrid category represent about, you know, somewhere between 25% to 50% uh, of uh, countries worldwide. And so I think Russia is 
sort of uh, out there on the forefront in terms of kind of inventing these hybrid technologies, which then um, you know sometimes get imitated by others, or uh, you know, or may maybe it can only exist in Russia, where you have the people that uh, you know kind of have this particular skill uh, involved and have the good fortune of being able to manage uh, you know economic growth, um, you know, on the basis, of, at least to a significant degree, of natural resource wealth. So um, it's, it's a broad category, hybrid regimes, and part of what we're doing here is to try and differentiate it and, uh, you know, look at what makes Russia, um, you know, unique within this category, um, despite the fact that I think there are some similar cases out there. David? Yeah. Uh, David Kramer of the German Marshall Fund. Um, Masha, I wanted to come back to Marvin Kalb's question about the tensions between the staffs and, and push you or, and maybe the others, too. When we look at the presidential administration, there are a number of people held over from when Putin was president. So which people specifically are the ones inside, not the ones on the outside? We know who those are. But on the inside, who are the ones pushing for Medvedev? You look at Sabyanin, hold over, Sirkovs, hold over. So which, which people are the key top Medvedev people? Thanks. Um. Well, I think I will start, maybe Nikolai will continue. Um, of course, the obvious person is uh, Natalia Timakova, who works for Medvedev uh, and uh, who is regarded as one of those engaged in struggles and tensions, and especially with Surkov. And she, I think, uh, is an ambitious and talented and creative woman, has seen herself humiliated by being uh, bossed by Surkov. And I think. Uh, purely speculative on my part that uh, uh, she would certainly want him out. Um, and it may be speculated, again purely speculative, that uh, some of the publications aimed directly at, um, at uh, Surkov in uh, the Russian independent media um, may have, I don't know, been somehow coordinated with her or whatever, something that she certainly likes to see when it appears. Um, I, I, I think it's, a, uh, it's also a limited view to see this just as tensions. Tensions are certainly there, but because there are, uh, there is a dual center of power. This very naturally leads to uh, uh, the lobbying effort being directed at two centers, not just one. Whereas previously, the President's administration was the, uh, the body where uh, decisions were taken, so lobbyists would uh, be geared there rather than elsewhere. Uh, today, um, uh, there is every reason to see both these, uh, uh, these venues as, as a target for lobbying effort, and we see evidence of that too. Well, I would add that uh, in most cases, these tensions are virtual. And uh, you are right when saying that, uh, uh, well, uh, Medvedev is surrounded by uh, almost the same guys uh, whom Putin left to him. So I would say that he's under house arrest, and uh, he's not in a position to replace them. So it took a year for him to replace speechwriter, and that's, that's, that's all. So uh, the system is well designed, and there are a few spheres where Medvedev can play a real role, and uh, judiciary is one of them to a certain extent. And you can see that, well, there is the whole bunch of guys, uh, Konovalov uh, uh, including, uh, who are taking care of some reforms, like, say, penitentiary system reform and uh, these new, uh, uh, well, uh, amendments uh, to make it easier for businessmen to not to stay in prison if uh, uh, doing uh, minor uh, violations of law and so on. But uh, generally speaking now, uh, in two years after Medvedev took the office, we can use fingers of our two hands to... Uh, name all those guys who are considered to be members of his team, but even these guys aren't, uh, uh, well, members of one of the same team. They came from the same class from St. Petersburg University, that's all. So they are closely connected to Medvedev in person, but it doesn't mean that, well, they're doing something. And uh, Commission on Modernization is another uh, case where Medvedev is playing a certain role. It looks like the, uh, well, minor government. And I was amazed, by the way, to see that in English there is no word for partition. 
Patiešny regiment was used uh, when Peter the Great was a small boy. So he played soldiers like his toys, and it was a kind of managerial game. So I would use this uh, word uh, in case of Medvedev's Commission on Modernization. It's his brainchild. He does invest a lot of efforts. They are meeting uh, on monthly basis. They are doing a lot, but uh, they are very limited. And these limits were uh, uh, well uh, proclaimed by Medvedev in his Go Forward uh, article. So it's allowed for them to invent something in order to make Russian pharmaceutical industry more competitive, but that's all. So it's about very limited number of uh, spheres where technological modernization can take place. And in SOAR, it's another interesting example. You know, it's usually used as, uh, uh, well, uh, it's usually percepted as Medvedev's think tank. It's, it's absolutely Absolutely not the case. So they do pretend uh, to to be Medvedev's think tank. That's all. So uh, the way how they do communicate with him is just like uh, being uh, on uh, unpopulated islands. So they're putting their reports into the bottle and waiting that sometime in future Medvedev uh, uh, will catch it and will will read it. That's all. So my reading of this last uh, in-source report is that uh, they uh, do no more hope on, uh, well, uh, playing certain role in decision making, and instead of writing reports for Medvedev, they went public with much more radical things. As someone who spent a fair amount of time studying Peter the Great, I'd only point out that some of those people in those regiments did pretty well. <laughs> anyway, yes, Masha, you had a, you had I, I just one an, tiny, an tiny here. remark. Uh, of course, uh, to those of you who remember Soviet political jokes, uh, are disappointed today when jokes are fewer. However, there is one exactly to illustrate what uh, Nikolai has just said, and it's very short. It says that uh, Medvedev should win the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take one more question and then we'll have to break up. So take the eye. Uh, Kathy Cosman, uh, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Um, two quick questions. One is, is there indeed a new policy towards the North Caucasus? There have been a few rumors of that. And two, <clears throat> if you could speculate on the chances of passage of a... Um, <clears throat> a new law on properties of religious institutions, which in fact, I've been told if it passes, um, would make the Russian, the Moscow Patriarchate the country's largest landowner. Um, maybe you take the Caucasus. Okay, I'll take the Caucasus, the easiest part of your, your, your <laughs> question. So uh, there are two regions which do attract Putin's attention most of all. It's the Far East and uh, it's Northern Caucasus. And uh, it's not, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, that strange that in both regions uh, there are new plenipotentiary envoys and both came uh, from governor's offices and they are considered to be good managers. So I would, I would uh, uh, read uh, uh, Hlaponin's appointment to North Caucasus as a sign that uh, no more the Kremlin uh, can count on this uh, military model of pacification, and they do try to do, and being very interested in this region due to the fact that uh, uh, Olympic Games is Putin's, uh, well, brainchild, and uh, he does invest a lot of efforts, including managerial attempts, and uh, he did use his best manager to deal with Olympics instead of dealing with less important problems like, say, center regions relations. Anyway, uh, the fact that Hlaponin was appointed there means that uh, they do try to play by uh, different rules of the game, but uh, there are no hopes, to my mind, that uh, it, will, uh, uh, it, will be, uh, it will be effective. I would say that Hlaponin can be seen as effective manager, but once again, uh, he is copied beggar, and never in his life uh, he dealt with uh, Caucasus and with national republics, which is very different uh, thing from from uh, well being successful manager in a big industrial plant and later in in a region like Krasnoyarsky Krai. And second, uh, 
uh, the problem with Northern Caucasus, well, it, it didn't appear when Putin came to power. It was accumulating for a pretty long time. It can explode any time in future, and uh, I would doubt that something can be done in a short while in order to fix this problem. Um, on, uh, um, uh, on the church issue, the new patriarch is very active and uh, politically clearly is very talented. Uh, and they actually has prerequisites of uh, becoming an independent political, political figure. According to one theory, uh, which is set forth in uh, a brilliant recent opinion piece in Vietnamese Daily, um, it's, written, uh, um, it's written that the uh, Kremlin is apprehensive of potential rise, ascent of, of the patriarch as a more independent political figure. Whether or not this is true, uh, the patriarch has been able to squeeze concessions and their material concessions from, uh, from the Kremlin uh, in a very short period of time, one of them being uh, um, that, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, church NGOs uh, will, um, be, will be qualified as the socially oriented ones, in any case will have special uh, favors from the government. Um, another has to do with property. Uh, there has been a scandalous instance, uh, instance yes, uh, recently when a precious icon was actually uh, um, shifted to a newly built church on uh, the territory of uh, the estate of uh, a Russian billionaire. Um, caused some scandal, of course, huge scandal, but was, was shifted nevertheless. And uh, there are uh, per, uh, permanent rumors that more precious uh, pieces of art um, and uh, actually buildings, uh, monasteries, uh, will become uh, effectively the property of the church. Okay, I want to thank all of you very much. And, um... <laughs> Thank the audience for good questions, and um, we will gather again in another few months to see how we're doing. Thanks very much, everyone.